about. Our first tool that's going to build off of some of the stuff we've been learning about diversity and this idea of heterogeneity and, and differences in, in space, um, that tool is going to be the notion of island biogeography theory. Um, now, as we go throughout, we're going we're gonna to start to hear about um, very common landscape ecology principles. This is not all of conservation biology, but this is a huge part of the core of conservation biology. So I'll just mention those really quickly, and then we'll be coming back to those you know, later. But so, so some key landscape ecology principles that will come into play in places like island biogeography, um, but, but also all over the place, would be the scale of the process we're talking about. So, so over what temporal and spatial scale is this stuff operating? Is this only influencing individuals within a millimeter from me, or is this something that's going to influence individuals over kilometers away from me? So the scale of the process. Heterogeneities we've just been talking about, the physical structural heterogeneity, really important. Disturbance, as we've already mentioned, right? So we can either say disturbance or we can say stability. They're different sides of the same coin. And then really key is not just is there heterogeneity, but how are those elements in the landscape physically oriented to one another? So how are they configured in, in, in the real world? And this will come up when we, particularly when we talk about uh, metapopulation dynamics uh, after today. Um, and so examples of spatial configuration in terms of a different, uh, say, a patch would be how big it is, the shape it is. Um, are they daisy chained out or are they sort of in a halo around uh, a core area, that type of stuff? And then how easily can critters move between those patches? These are all aspects of spatial configuration. And then another key one is this fundamental idea, especially for, for island biogeography, is this idea of species area curves, as you guys have been reading about. Um, we have a bunch of tools that we'll be starting to go over in the coming weeks. So again, you don't need to write these down, but just to sort of whet your appetite, we'll start talking about island biogeography. We'll talk about metapopulations, wildlife corridors, the whole idea of spatial refuges or refugia, and then different approaches that we're taking to try to deal with this stuff. GIS is a huge part of this which is why GIS is a fundamental part of our ESRM curriculum. If you guys are a bio major, you really, really need to take our intro to GIS. It is a fundamental tool. Um, people use it all over the place. It's like, it's, it's basically like Word and Excel now. You have to have, you don't have to be the world's best user of GIS, but you need some basic understanding how to navigate this. More and more of our world um, is, is being interpreted spatially. And so this is a, a key tool to engage with um, landscape planning. And then this whole idea of movement ecology, looking at that, that's really exploded. So eco ecologists, conservationists have always looked at movement, but in the last two decades, two, three decades, the technology to follow organisms moving throughout the environment has just absolutely exploded. And it's gotten fantastically more sophisticated and much more helpful. It has huge implications for managing uh, resources. So today we're just going to talk about island biogeography theory. Okay. Uh, as a reminder, biogeography is the study of how organisms are distributed across the earth. Um, and so we first look at that distribution as the first step into understanding what the underlying patterns are, the underlying factors that are driving it. So first we just look at where things are, and then we can start to ask why questions. And so we usually start with organisms, but you can also talk about communities, genes, other levels of, of diversity um, be applied. So biogeography is how things, how life is distributed in space is basically what we're talking about. A key aspect um, of this that you've been doing readings on and all this uh, good stuff is this idea of islands. Now, our idea of islands, oh, it's in our name. We are Cal California State University Channel Islands. We're named after an island chain, right? We have a, we have a, we have a research lab, a station on Santa Rosa. Is, is anybody, has anybody not been to Santa Rosa Island in this class, just out of curiosity? So if you guys are interested, we, we have a trip, um, well, the Sunday is probably too late, but we have a trip this Sunday. We also have a trip uh, next Friday, if you guys are interested in going, a day trip. And, we, and, and it was 
for some of our seniors in ESRM, but we might have some, some free spaces still. So if you guys are interested after class, come talk to me if you're interested in doing a day trip on two Fridays from now to the islands. Regardless, regardless, um, islands are relatively small. Islands, meaning you know, traditional islands out in the ocean, make up only about 7% of the total terrestrial area um, of our planet in terms of stuff that's out in the middle of the ocean or next to a, next to a, um, a continent. So relatively small, right? 7%, relatively small. Um, they're mostly in places like the, the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, etc. cetera. Um, they're arranged in different ways. And uh, I'll just put a pin in it real quick to say that we have, so when we say islands, we mostly think of you know, Hawaii or Santa Rosa Island, but islands can have other meanings too. So here's some of our oceanic islands, right? There's, there's salt and peppered across the Pacific, uh, salt and peppered across the Atlantic, uh, in the Indian, and in the Arctic. Um, we have different categories that we historically have thought about islands as. We talk about arcs, um, which is something like the Aleutians or the Lesser Antilles, um, where the islands kind of curve. They, they, they sort of go in a line and they kind of on, on a curvy line. Um, we can talk about island chains that tend to be more in a straight line. Clusters, where, where there's a grouping of islands. They're not like, they're not necessarily in a line, but, but they're just kind of in the vicinity of one another. So things like the Galapagos or, or Fiji would be examples of clustered islands. And then we had, do have islands that are just by themselves, just by themselves. So out in the middle of nothing nearby, uh, Easter Island, which is an example we've already talked about, is, is uh, one example. Nauru, we've talked about that. Um, and then uh, we have some areas where there's just a ton. It's just like the place is lousy with islands. And so that would be examples of that would be off the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia, in the Philippines, uh, Greece, etc. And so, yeah, examples of all these guys. Cool. What kind of the channel islands? Uh, channel islands would be a chain. Yeah. Okay, so, the, so obviously those are the, the traditional islands. Those are important. We'll talk about those in a second. But it is important to also make sure we know that in the conservation context, we, are, we increasingly see the world as remnant patches or remnant islands in a sea of otherness. Okay, so some of those examples are... Oh, why can't you guys see that? That's weird. Huh, I wonder why you can't see that. Anyway, so, um, so okay, so here, I already showed that, that example, those forest patches, right? That was on the upper uh, center right. That was a big contiguous forest, right? We wouldn't have called that an island. But then we fragmented it, and we've essentially created little pockets of, of islands. Is that an island in the water? No. If you're a coyote, can you go from one patch to the other? Sure. But if you're a beetle, maybe you can't. So to a beetle, each of those going from patch one to patch two might be the same as, I don't know, a snake trying to go from one channel island to the other, right? It's, it's theoretically possible, but it, it ain't easy, right? Other examples we could talk about are these lakes in the lower left, right? We have these little, um, you know, so here's a, a dollop of water. And if you're a fish, you can't walk on land, so you can't really get to the next one unless there's like a flooding event or something, right? Uh, and, we, and then the other classic ones would be things like mountaintops. So as, as probably we all know, we've all been to the top of a mountain or so. Um, there's certain critters that do well there, but they can't do well when we get to lower elevations. And so in effect, even though, there are, yes, they could walk down, the land touches and they go to the valley and they can walk up to the next uh, top of the mountain peak. But in reality, in effect, they really function like islands. Okay, so that's the setting for island biogeography theory that you've read the, the, one of the foundational papers in already and you've watched some videos on this. Um, so this shouldn't be new. So this is uh, 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 MacArthur and Wilson. Come up with this idea. And the idea, as you saw from um, E.O. Wilson's description in his, in his uh, video, was um, to look at diversity in this case, species richness. Look at species richness 
um, as a function of how big the island is and how far it is from maybe the foundational population, which we classically would envision that being on the mainland or on the continent. Um, it's become a fundamental tool for conservation biology as we've made the world more island-like, right? And so this is a key tool as we're planning protected areas um, in a sea, so a remnant grassland, remnant wetland, remnant whatever forest in a sea of inhospitable human disturbed landscapes. Okay, so here are some of the key predictions of island biogeography theory. One, that the number of species on an island, uh, if left to its own devices, would eventually stabilize and it would become constant over time. No disturbance, nothing else, just time. Uh, there might be species turnover, right? So, so, so one individual might wink out at some point, but then another individual would wink in, right? Kind of idea. So there's some kind of idea of the stability going on. Other key predictions are that large islands are going to harbor more species than a small island. And as we go farther away from the mainland or farther away from the source population, there will be fewer individuals on average on, on you know, a given island. Okay, so the, um, the first version that we talk about is the so-called equilibrium model. This is like the, the first formulation. And so again, this is, this is gonna predict what goes, what's going on with species richness in a given, on a given island. And it's gonna result from two opposite forces. So adding individuals and individuals going extinct. So colonizing and extinction. So the, the, the colonizing is going to happen when individuals migrate from the mainland to the island. The extinction is going to happen on the island. When, when something happens, a critter is outcompeted, or maybe there's you know, something and the animal's blown off the island or whatever. And so essentially what we're talking about here is a trade-off between adding and taking away, or colonization and extinction. And so this is the original simplest model. And so in this model, uh, S equals the number of species. A is the area. Uh, and um, C is a constant that's going to be related to the, the ecology of this critter, the, the, the um, uh, diversity of that, that area. And then Z is just going to be a constant. And so Z is a key thing that we'll talk about. Okay, so, so, we, so, okay, here we go. So here's a, a classic species area curve, right, which you guys can, should all be able to sketch out now, right? So it's, it's area, some measure of size on the bottom, and then some measure of diversity on the axis, typically species richness. And so there we go, right? And as you, as you recall, when we first start, when we add sample one square meter, oh, everything's new. We get many new species. And then we sample a second square meter, and we get more species, but maybe not quite as many as the first one. And as we go through time, we're eventually doing a really good job of, of measuring the whole area. And eventually, we're going to start to asymptote and get towards the, the, uh, you know, the equilibrium level, if you will, of, of that uh, community. If we take that same tr classic equation, and so this is why when Caleb said in, the, in this graph, hey, can I just draw it as a, as a straight line? I said, yeah, you get credit. Because um, technically, that's a, that's a log transformed axis, but it's a lot easier for us to deal with the math of straight lines than curvy lines, right? I think you guys like geometry more than calculus, generally speaking. And so, um, so while it's, it's, it's equivalent mathematically, it's just a little bit easier to deal with um, the, the straight lines oftentimes. And so all we've done is, is change this axis down here from a linear to a logarithmic axis. And then when we do that, um, the, the, the Z becomes the slope of the line. Okay, so here's what we're talking about. Uh, here is uh, island biogeography in terms of the addition side of the equation, right? So the addition side of the equation, we have number of species on the, on the um, X-axis going from low to high. 
And note on the, on the y-axis, this is a rate. Make sure you jot down in your notes. This is a rate, How, uh, a, a change over time. Okay? And that rate is going to go from low on the bottom to high on the, on the top. And for uh, purposes it will be clear in a second, I have two curves on here. So one is for an island that's far away, a generic far away island. And one is for an island that's relatively near to uh, the mainland. And as you note, there's a different curve. So if I'm, so, okay, so here's the number of species. So if I'm uh, on a far away island, I'm going, and I, and I, and I look at this, um, I'm going to accumulate species at a different rate. Oh, excuse me, I'm going to have a colon. The rate at which critters are going to colonize, on average, is going to happen slow. Where am I? Am I am back? Is it going to be on average slower than if we were nearby? This will make sense in a second. Now let's look at the other half of this, which is that the thing is disappearing from my island. Again, it is. Uh, this is number of species on the bottom. And this is rate on the y-axis, again, going from low to high. So here, now, and, and so this is the extinction rate. This is the disappearance rate. So here now, instead of having a near or far, distance away, I'm saying, is it big or small? So here I have a small island versus a large island. And what I'm saying here is for any, any given area, the, or any, any given um, uh, uh, situation that we start with, small, uh, uh, the extinction rate is going to happen more quickly on a small island than a faraway island. And we put these together, we get essentially the equilibrium model for island biogeography theory. And so this is what it says. Okay, so this is, again, this is a after a long period of time, what we're going to see happen. And because this is a rate, because this is a rate, everybody with me? Because this is a rate, things are going to go to a stability point. How do I think about that? Think about that as a marble. You might remember this from some of your earlier intro bio class. Think of it as a marble. So I'm going to take my marble. I'm going to drop my marble here, and over time, it's going to go to a stable point. So imagine these curves are actually surfaces or ramps. Everybody with me? So I'm going to drop my marble here, and then the over time, the marble is going to roll and it's going to choo -choo -choo and it's going to end up stopping here. It's going to be at this stable point. So if I'm at a small, where am I? If I'm at a small nearby island, I would predict that over time, I would predict that I'd have this number of species. Everybody with me? If I was on a far away small island, I would predict I would have this number of species, right? So the number of species on a far small away island is going to be less after we've had some time to mellow out, equilibrate. Make sense? Similarly, if I'm on a large island that's nearby, when it's stable, when we come to our stability point, we're going to have a high, relative high number of species. So where, so let me ask you guys, where are we going to get our, uh, the most number of species in this theory, in this model? What type of island? Large, large near, right? This one, large near. And where are we going to have the lowest number, the fewest number of species? Far away and relatively small, right? So I'm on the small one here and I'm on the far one here. Does that make sense how we're getting there? Questions about that? Okay, so yeah, go ahead. So what are these? Okay, this is, this is the, the equilibrium number of species. And so after we've had a, a given amount of time for our island to come into equilibrium, this is where we'd expect the stability point would be. So this is, we'd expect this number of species, and it's, right now it's just, it's just a generic scale. So it's just a, a conceptual model at this point. But what it's saying is that, it's saying that um, the far uh, small islands are gonna have very few species. It's gonna say that um, the uh, uh, near small is gonna have an intermediary level of species. And the large near is gonna have the most number of species. Does that make sense? 
cool. Other questions? Okay. So in general, uh, uh, the, we see, you know, the reason that um, MacArthur and Wilson started, came up with this is because they were making observations and we see evidence that this is actually going on. So in general, we do see species richness tend to increase as island size gets bigger, and that's what this data shows. And to decrease as we go away from the parental source from the, the continent or the main island. Next, I want to introduce uh, a, a another, uh, one more key idea, idea here. And um, land bridge islands versus oceanic islands, I want to illustrate it with us. So what do I mean by oceanic island? An oceanic island is something that was just ocean, and then boom, we got, a, we got a, an island that came out usually from a, a volcano. So anybody remember who came up with the theory of, of these island formations? Chuck D. Darwin. Darwin, right? So again, Darwin would have been famous if he just did any one of the, the innovations, observations he made, but he did a lot of things. So, okay. So this is from his original manuscript and basically, um, right, so we have this thing and we start off and we initially have vo a volcano, a rock deposition, and eventually it breaks in over the, this is the surface of the ocean, breaks up, forms this, and then over time it erodes, and then the coral, the life takes over, and then we have, instead of rock, we have calcium carbon, instead of non-living rock, we have um, biogenic calcium carbonate coral reef skeletons that form, and they, before climate change, they kept, they generally kept up with the, the, you know, changing sea levels. If the sea rose a little bit, they would, they would grow at a rate that would be able to meet that. So that's an oceanic island. In, in contrast, a land bridge island was something that originally was physically attached to the mothership. So in our case, was originally attached to a continent, let's say. And then, because of erosion, because of sea level rise, because of whatever, we essentially now have, um, have these islands that were created. Yeah? So would the Channel Islands be then a land? Almost, almost. Yeah, yeah, so, so I'm going to use them as an example because there are islands and I want an example. So I'm going to use them. They technically weren't, at least in the last several glaciations, they weren't technically connected, but they were very, very close to being connected. So they were almost. And if we go back far enough in time, then yes, they were. OK. So uh, land bridge islands, we see this all over the place. Um, one of the consequences of this, and one of the first, th first things that get started getting people to think about this, was the Wallace line. Remember, Alfred Wallace was a contemporary of Darwin. In pa parallel, came up with this you know, basic same idea of evolution by natural selection. He sent his manuscript to Darwin, which made Darwin poop his pants and then suddenly write it really quick and get it published so that Darwin would get credit. Because um, this was the young upstart who's living out in Indonesia going, man, I'm noticing all these things. I think this is what's going on. I'm going to write to the expert. And the expert's like, oh, dang. So we now refer to uh, some, of the, some of the diversity patterns that he discovered as the Wallace line, for example, that has to do with uh, critters, a, a different group of critters, a different assemblage north of the solid line on average versus the critters on the islands south of that line. And we have a very similar one that has to do with plants in a slightly different place, right? So that, that showed up, oops, what happened? We also can see this in terms of where we have the distribution of tigers, where we have the distribution of rhinoceros, um, et cetera. So all this, if, we did, if you and I just looked at this, we might kind of say, that's kind of weird. Why, why, why did the tigers go only this far, but the rhinoceros went that much farther? Or why did the animal assemblages go this far, but the plant assemblages, right? So it's kind of hard to figure out at first. One way to think about this is that, again, stuff wasn't always the way it is now. Stuff has been changing. So let's talk about us. So this is, this, here's campus. I put campus in there in the red. Here's campus. And then here is this Santa Rosa, here, here's this big giant island that were, that were the main channel islands. Um, but, uh, during and just before the last big glacial uh, period cycle, right? Start of the Pleistocene. And so, and so at this point, we're not technically connected, but we're really, really close to connected to the mainland. So, so I'm going to use this as kind of an example as a land bridge island, right? So that's how we started, and this is how we are now. Now we're like, 
17 miles away to get to the nearest one, right? It's a lot of open water, really far, right? Because the sea levels have changed. And the sea levels changed um, about 100 meters, right? And so we flooded all those areas that used to be um, uh, 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 terrestrial. So what we have, so we have these islands, and we have this, if we're still on this idea of equilibrium processes, um, those are going on. But check out what's happening. It's, very, it's a very different way of how we get there. With the Hawaiian Islands that were volcanic, boom, volcano, brrr, lava, boom, stop lava. Okay, now the lava stopped. Now we have nobody on the island. And then over time, we're going to accumulate. We're going from none to some number of species, right? So we're going to build up as we go through time. That would be an oceanic island. A land bridge island is going to be different because we were part of the mainland. So we're going to start with a ton of things, a ton of things. And then over time, not everybody's going to be able to hang in the new environment, in the smaller environment. Right? The classic one would be what? What are, what are the classic critters that we, ha we had on the Channel Islands that we don't have anymore? Mammoth. Mammoths, right. We don't have any, if we go out there now, there's no mammoths. Whereas back then, when I first showed that first slide, there were, there were mammoths cruising around out there, right? So we call this, so, so this is colonization, right? We call this relaxation, this phenomenon, where we go from a higher level of diversity to a different stable point that is lower than the original diversity. Which of these do you think is going to be more common for, in a conservation context? Yes. Right. Right. So the reason we're talking about land bridge is because they're a model for what we're doing to the planet, right? We're starting with a, a big contiguous large area and then, oops, sorry, here's a smaller one. And so when we first go in the first year, we're like, what? We're partying, right? It's all kinds of everybody's here. But then over time, those critters are getting lost, right? As we start to stabilize, as we start to go through these processes of extinction, et cetera, we're going to, um, with, a, with an oceanic island, we start and we add species to get to the equilibrium. With a land bridge island, we start with a lot of species and they, they degrade or they so-called relax. Make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know why I showed that again, but I did. Okay. Oh, yeah, just a reminder. So again, here, here's that, here's the, 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 with a linear graph, the species accumulation curve, right? Species area curve. Uh, and then we just transform it with a, um, a log transform on the, on the X axis. And then Z becomes the slope, right? And so in practice, we typically calculate Z by just plotting species versus area on a logarithmic scale. And we, and we just sort of say, okay, that's, that's what the Z looks like. And then we can compare the Zs. We can compare the Zs for, for research purposes and stuff. Um, yeah, okay. And I'll just, say, I'll just say in the conservation context, that slope will change. So let's, let's look at some different forms of island biogeography models. So we have this simple one that we've been talking about, which is just looking at colonization and extinction. And that makes total sense as we're conceptually trying to understand this. But what we've had since that era, since that era of the late 60s, early 70s, we've had people build upon that and create more sophisticated models. So still that, that the simple model is at its core, but we add a bunch of other descriptors or a bunch of other things um, where we're specifically looking at effects of different colonization rates. So it's not just maybe one simple rate, but a, a, a range of rates. Um, and, and distance from the mainland. But then there could be direction. Maybe, maybe, these, maybe this is a wind-blown seed and the winds always go from east to west or something, right? So we, we can add some, some um, more spatial reality um, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna run through some examples for you guys now. So all you have to really know is that we have the, the, the simplified model and we can make them more complex. That's all you need to take away from this slide. Okay, so let's see, does island biogeography really work? Is this really real? Um, so here's an example from uh, James Brown. Ha! Not that one, a different James Brown. Wow, you guys didn't think, uh, I'm not funny at all for you guys apparently, okay. Um, okay, uh, so you guys know who James Brown is though, right? Oh shit. 
Yes, you all need to go Google James Brown and listen to some James Brown, uh, James Brown album tonight. Maybe I should make that the next quiz question. Okay, so um, anyway, um, uh, okay, so he, uh, so this James Brown, which is not the James Brown you can listen to, this James Brown, um, uh, hold on, I gotta take a picture of you guys. I gotta, I gotta send this to my friends and say, these guys did not know who James Brown was. Okay, good. okay. No, 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 to, to, to my friends that, that, that work on this stuff. Like I said, these guys didn't know who James Brown was. Okay, so mountaintop islands, mountaintop islands. So this guy said, hey, so this, this is right in the early days of formation. He said, hey, does, does this apply to non-islands in the water? And so let me look at mountaintops. And maybe we can consider mountaintops as in effect islands. And so particularly the very, very tops of tall mountains. So peaks of mountains that are taller than 10,000 feet. Okay, and so to, to make it uh, you know, a, a nice initial test, he said, I'm only going to look at peaks that are really, really tall and that are separated by a large amount, at least five miles or more of low-lying valley or, or low elevation stuff. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not, we're not doing like a mountain chain where it's mountaintop, 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 mountaintop kind of thing. And what he found was that um, uh, the species richness that he found of the, of the critters on that mountaintop island um, only... Um, uh, correlated with the, the, the size. It, the, the distance didn't seem to make a difference. Um, and there was no correlation with how far they were from the parental source, from the, the, the big mountain chain. So, so, some, so some evidence that, yeah, something about this is working, but not as, not as straightforward as we first thought. So that was James Brown uh, Mountains. And then Lawler comes in a bit later and says, hey, what about this, we just talk, we're talking about land bridge versus oceanic uh, uh, potential islands. And so he looked at a volant, meaning flying um, vertebrates, so birds and bats, and non-volant, or, and these are all terrestrial organisms, so, so critters that walk, a coyote, a cat, a dog, that, that squirrel, that kind of stuff. And he found that land bridge islands, like our Channel Islands, were not at equilibrium for, uh, for these guys, for the, for the walking and crawling critters. And he said, um, uh, yeah, and so, and so, so he said um, uh, that that was, it's, it, the, the unique history seemed to be more important than this equilibrium theory. But that for bats, bats, it, it did work for bats. So bats could more easily move across the ocean, move from patch to patch, from island to island, could disperse more readily, that actually they did seem to be in equilibrium. So, so far we have two examples. We have some support, but not complete support. Everybody with me? From some support, but not complete support from uh, mountaintops and from uh, land bridge versus oceanic islands. Obviously, the, the key, the, 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 the thing that really got this going, you've already read about this and seen videos on this, but the key thing here was the work of um, E.O. Wilson and his then graduate student, Daniel Simberloff, um, who went to these mangrove little patches, and some of them are very small. You can see how, see how small this is. This is logistically easy to do, right? And they tarped up these areas and hired a, um, a fumigation company that would normally go to your house and fumigate for termites and had them fumigate this and they collected all the, uh, for, for, sorry, first they, they surveyed the islands, then they fumigated it, right, and they killed everything, caught everything, and then, and then took the covers off and left it. So we start, they essentially started with what you can imagine as effectively being an oceanic island, right? So started with nobody, or at least insects, no insects on there, and then every few months, Simberloff would go out and, and survey and see how, what species were on the, on the islands. Right, and this is his original data. This is original data, right? So we start with here. In this case, it's not area, but it's days. So it's time. It's time uh, since it was defaunated. And then here we have uh, the faraway islands and the, the near islands, etc. cetera. And, and what we see is we start at time and nobody has any insects on them to start with. And as we go through time, there's more and more species and more, and, and they all seem to eventually get to some plateau. But note, it's not the same plateau. So the plateau seems to be driven by the size of the island. And so this is what the, the key findings from this initial work were that um, the islands nearest the mainland captured 
critter is the fastest, right? So, so it was easiest for an insect to fly 10 meters rather than flying a mile or whatever it is. Um, I, I told you how they did it. Um, after a year, so they gave, so they, they gave it a year of mon as you did more, but, but the initial work showed that after a year, um, the closer islands um, still recovered faster. So not only did they, did they, did the first recruits arrive there fastest, even after a year, they were still accumulating critters faster than, or, or, they, or you could say it as the colonization rate was higher than the faraway islands. And they, but they all seem to be getting to some level of equilibrium, right? Some level of, of, of asymptoting here. Um, and there was turnover. So it wasn't that, there were, that these, these 12 species stayed the 12 species. There may be st there were still 12 species, but maybe the individual's identity would swap over, over time. One would disappear, one, one other one would, would come in. Make sense? Okay, so three, three things. So we have the, the mangrove islands, the, the, o the um, uh, mountaintop islands, and the land bridge stuff. And then uh, it's a popular thing to do. So a lot of people have done this since. And so in this case, this is um, looking at reptiles in some urban uh, parks in Australia. And so for snakes, snakes, and this is a log scale in the x-axis, right, area, and species on the right. Um, for snakes, it does, when we fit the curve, do the best fit curve, it actually is positive. So it does follow the same trend that, that um, larger remnants have more snakes. And most of the lizards, this happens as well. When we talk about the subcategory of skinks, it doesn't seem to work for skinks. So it doesn't work for all critters, but for some critters it does, right? Here's another example. Uh, well, actually, sorry, this, this, is, this is the same example, but this, here's another, I should say, this is another example of data, but check it out. So here is, um, uh, uh, what's going on. So here is, is that example, I so this example right here is now in tabular form. Okay, so here's, here's, here's what we found in terms of mammals, amphibians, reptiles, lizards, snakes, etc. Then these guys went to an offshore island and looked at the, the same kind of idea of, of um, uh, roughly the same area, and this is what they found. And I sorry, I shouldn't say it's the same area. It's, it's, it's bigger, but it's, it's in the grand scheme of things, it was, it was, they were trying to compare it as a model. So here we go. So we have one native mammal, three amphibians, 19 um, reptiles, 17 lizards, two snakes. So how would, how would we interpret this? How would you guys interpret this? So what's, what's going on with our park, our mainland island urban park thing? Jonathan. Right, good. So it's, it's kind of roughly similar in that it's got some, so it seems to be a, a comparable thing that's got some mammals, got some amphib, right? So we're, we're not like talking like a desert and a rainforest or something, right? But that, yeah, so this guy has been isolated for thousands of years. This fragment has been isolated for many decades type of thing. And, uh, and so, so yeah, so this is, this is on a mainland. It's probably started with more individuals, but that it's, it's looking so, so, so that, that's one conclusion. Good. Another one I hope you guys would take is that it does look sort of vaguely similar to this island. Are you guys with me? Not exactly. But, but hey, so, so maybe there is some value in thinking of this, this park as an island, which at first, first glance might have looked stupid. Like, what? That's not an island. That's just a park in the city. But, but it seems like some of the forces um, are, are similar are potentially similar between these things, structuring this diversity. Everybody cool? Okay, here's another example. This is looking at birds in England on these little small uh, forest fragment patches. And uh, so these so the Brits love insects, the Brits love birds. They love to walk around and count birds. So there's a lot of great data on birds from the UK. Um, and so in this case, these, these, this set of, um, this set of, uh, of, uh, of patches have been, has been monitored since 1950. And this, this subset of the data is for about the first 30 years. 
Um, and so every year these guys go out in the breeding season and they, they look for, hey, what, what birds are in these patches? And what they found is in these different patches, uh, somewhere around 28 to 36 species are in any one patch in any one year. In their whole data set, they have a total of 45 different species they, they've encountered. Well, at least they encountered in those first 30 years. The issue is only 16 of those 28 to 36, though, only 16 of these species bred every year. Um, with only five species having more than one pair. And so having a pair of chicks is, is, is considered replacement, right? So then there's, there's a baby for mom, there's a baby for dad, right? So only five species uh, on any one patch was making babies enough to make, make more moms and dads in that patch. So that tells us that uh, there's got to be some connection between here, right? Otherwise, these birds must be dispersing between some of these patches. Otherwise, it would go extinct, right? We'd only have five species in this network, right? So that tells us that there is some colonization going on. There is some movement going from patch one to patch two, that type of deal. Cool? All right. Um, and then uh, just some last stuff that we'll wrap up with here is some other examples for island biogeography. As you guys had from the reading, we mentioned uh, Krakatoa. So we can see that with once Krakatoa happens, the big Indonesian volcano, boom, and then kills a bunch of stuff. And then folks looked at how things came back and recolonized. And so, so the, the qualitative pattern of how birds came back seems to follow island biogeography patterns. It didn't really work for plants, but for birds, it did seem to work. Um, we, uh, another uh, example would uh, see the same thing from desert thistles that are colonized by different um, uh, insects and arachnids, different spiders. And they seem to follow island bio the predictions of island biogeography, the equilibrium model. And then of course we have the Simberloff example um, uh, of the mangrove islands that we talked about. Um, what do I want to say about this? Okay, so almost done here. So I'll just say uh, uh, this is really, really important for the idea that we will talk about after spring break of this idea called protected area design. So how do we make a park? How do we make a refuge, right? So in some cases, it's what we got. Some, some billionaire gives us his property and it's like, okay, here's the property. But in most cases, we are creating something. We're, de we're deciding where are the boundaries. And so when it comes to that, when it comes to you and I deciding how big should we make something, how small should we make it, what should the shape be, all that stuff, um, island biogeography is really helpful in terms of thinking about um, how we might approach this, at least initially. So it provides a conceptual approach for how we can understand an increasingly fragmented landscape, especially terrestrial areas. It can provide a theoretical basis for explaining relatively impoverished patches because maybe they're too far from the dispersal source. The colonization rate is too low, for example. Um, they can also form a, 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 a framework for making predictions on if we do create something, how many critters do we think might eventually end up being able to live in this area or, or survive in this area? Um, the, the classic island biogeography theory is, is usually not used so much anymore, but it's at the core of many other more sophisticated models. So conceptually, it's the foundation for a lot of these, even though we, don't, we use more um, sophisticated things in, in the real world today. Um, and it really it helps a lot with the network design. So here's, here's one example, right? So for example, um, here are some, some ideas for island. So if we're going to design a protected area and we're going to make some spaces, generally speaking, bigger is better than smaller. Generally speaking, um, uh, larger design or la larger patch is better than the same area that's divided more finely. Um, close by patches, generally speaking, better than far away patches. Um, and, and, and this is the same idea of proximity, it's just in, in a different way of saying it in space. And having a facilitated movement between protected area one and protected area two is better than not having facilitated connectivity between the two. Think of a wildlife crossing or a wildlife bridge, which we'll see later in the semester. And if we can minimize edge effects, that's better. So the, the 
the ultimate minimization would be a circle. Um, we can't always get a circle, but that's going to be better than something that's super, super long and thin where essentially the whole area is essentially an edge. Um, there's all kinds of limits to island biogeography theory. Um, I think I just want to skip over this because we're running out of time. Um, and so I'll just say, ah, never mind. I guess, I guess we'll talk about this and then I'll end it up this slide. So, so I'll just say empirical evidence. Uh, so we use empirical evidence to, to test these, these models. Um, but oftentimes, we're, uh, historically, the ways we've tested these, they're not really looking at the processes. They're looking at the patterns that result. So, so there's a challenge in that to really, really test these models, we like to look at the actual moving, not just you know, the colonization, like watching it happen, not just looking at the after effect of the colonization rate. And we don't always, we don't always do that but, that, but that can be a much more powerful way to test them. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence of a lot of turnover in all of our sites. So theoretically, that should happen. This is an equilibrium model, the, the simplest one and things should be turning over, and things do turn over, but the, the things don't seem to turn over as fast as we might assume in some of the more simplistic models. Um, important to know that this is, for, this is for diversity. This is for the richness of plants. This isn't for plant one or plant two. This isn't for individual identity. This is for the diversity of, you know, the richness maybe you really care about a foundational species like a salmon or a bear. This is not going to tell you if the bear or the salmon is going to get there. It's just going to tell you how many vertebrates, let's say, or how many plants are going to get there. Um, this is really a like, short-term thing. So this is the, at the time scale of ecology, not so much the time scale of evolution. So not at the scale of Darwin's finches. This is the scale of this, which is actually good in a conservation context because we're, we're also not operating at the scale of, of evolution, uh, or the, t the time scale of evolution, usually. Um, it doesn't follow speciation either. Um, uh, the, the, the classic model doesn't look at edge effects, disturbance, and these other things, um, et cetera. So I'll just, I'll just say that. So, so the point is, there are some caveats. It's not perfect, but it's a good start. It's a good conceptual start that we've, we've been working on since. So long story short, um, island biogeography is most useful in a conservation context dealing with things like fragmentation. That's where it really uh, helps out. The idea is a balance between colonization, adding, and extinction, things going away. It's a dynamic process. Um, we talked about the difference between oceanic and land bridge islands or, or Situations where we're mostly adding species to or species where, we're, where we are relaxing and losing species from. And this idea of relaxation is a major aspect of the design of protected areas, a major concern and worry when it comes to protected areas. Cool? Questions about any of that? Okay. Awesome, awesome. Great. Um, let me kill this real quick. <laughs>